بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلال وكل دلالة في النار ثم أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today's lesson insha'Allah ta'ala will be dealing with another beautiful hadith from the authentic sunnah of Al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a hadith that has been agreed upon between Al-Bukhari al-Muslim as being an authentic hadith. It is mutafiq alayhi. We begin this hadith asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up for us the door of understanding and to make us of those who are sincere. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was the narrator of this hadith he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no one spoke in the cradle except three people Isa ibn Maryam and the companion of Juraj the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say Juraj was a man who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously and he made for himself a small tower so as to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therein one day, while in his tower, his mother came to him while he was praying, and she called out, Ya Juraj, Ya Juraj, O Juraj, O Juraj. So he said to himself, O oh Allah, my mother, or my salah. So he ignored his mother and he continued to pray. So she left. The next day, his mother came to him again at the time in which he was praying. So she called out to him for the second time and she said, Ya Juraj, Ya Juraj. So he said, O oh Allah, my salah or my mother. So he ignored his mother for the second time and he continued to pray. So she went away. She came to him again the third day. And again she found him praying. So she called out to him for the third time, Ya Juraj, Ya Juraj. So he said, O oh my Lord, my mother or my salah. So he ignored her and he continued to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon doing so, his mother became very angry and she made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Juraj and she said, Oh Allah, do not cause him to die except that he has been tried by the prostitutes. So one day, some of the people of Bani Israel, they were sitting together and they were talking about Juraj and his extensive worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were praising him. And they came to him, to these people who were sitting there, a lewd woman who was extremely beautiful and who happened to be the daughter of the leader of those people. She said to these people who were sitting there from Bani Israel, if you people wish, I can seduce Juraj and I can make him slip from his lofty position. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on to say, so she presented herself to Juraj in all of her beauty, but Juraj paid no attention to her whatsoever. So she came to a shepherd who happened to be resting under the tower of Juraj. He was resting in the shade. So she invited this man to come to her so as to have sex with her. So he agreed. And because of this relationship in which they had together, the woman became pregnant. So what she did was she got up and she went throughout the city and she began to tell the people, I am pregnant from Juraj. I am pregnant from Juraj. When she finally gave birth to the child, the people came to Juraj. And they dragged him from outside. They dragged him from his tower. And they began to beat him. And they began to hit him. And they destroyed his tower. So they said, So Juraj said to them, What is wrong with you people? What's the problem? What's wrong with you people? So they tied his hands up. And they wanted to stone him. And all of the people of the city came out to see his stoning. They said to him, Verily you have made Zina with this woman, O Juraj. And you have given her this baby. So Juraj upon seeing this and hearing this and seeing that they were about to stone him, he said, where is this baby? So they came to him with the child. 
He said, leave me until I make salah. So they gave him the opportunity to make salah. So he made wudu and then he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After praying, he came to the child. And he poked the child in its side and he said, oh child, who is your father? So the baby said, shepherd so and so is my father. Upon seeing this and hearing this, all of the people of the city came to Juraj and they started to kiss him and they started to rub him for the barakah. And they said, O oh Juraj, let us build for you a tower to worship in, made out of gold. Juraj said, no, that's okay. Just repair my first tower as it was and leave me alone. The Prophet ﷺ went on to explain that the third person who spoke in the cradle was a boy who was suckling from his mother's breast. When a man appeared before them riding on a magnificent horse and wearing the best clothes that money could buy. Upon seeing this, the child's mother said, Oh Allah, I beseech you to make my son like this man. Upon hearing the words of the mother, the infant let loose the breast of his mother and he looked at the man and then he said, Oh Allah, I beseech you, do not make me similar to this man. So Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is the narrator of this hadith, he said, it is, if, it is as if I'm looking at the Prophet ﷺ when he demonstrated to us how the child was suckling. The Prophet took his pointing finger and he put it in his mouth and he proceeded to suck so as to show us. So the Prophet ﷺ said, So they passed by a group of people who were hitting a slave girl and saying to her, You fornicator, you thief. And she was responding to their hitting her and their cursing her. Simply by saying, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Which means, Allah is enough for me, and Allah is a good one to depend on. So the child's mother said, upon seeing this and hearing this, O oh Allah, I beseech you, please don't make my child like this girl. So the child left suckling his mother's breast again, and he said, O oh Allah, I beseech you, make me similar to this girl. At that point, the mother looked at her child in amazement and in astonishment. And she said, a man passed by us, and he had the best apparel and the best appearance. So I said, oh Allah, I beseech you to make my son similar to this man. And you said, oh Allah, I beseech you not to make me similar to him. And then we came upon this slave girl, and they were hitting her, and saying, you fornicator, you thief. So I said, oh Allah, I beseech you, do not make my child similar to her. And you said, oh Allah, make me similar to her. The child said, as for the man... Verily, he was an arrogant, oppressive tyrant. So I said, O oh Allah, I beseech you, do not make me similar to this man. And as for the one that they said about her, you've fornicated and you've stole, she didn't steal, nor did she fornicate. So I said, O oh Allah, I beseech you, to make me similar to this girl. This hadith, as I've said previously, is an authentic hadith that has been narrated or collected by Bukhari as well as Muslim and it has been collected by Al Imam Ahmed and Abu Ya'al Al Mosali and Al Haythami in his famous book Majma Al Zawaid that every student of knowledge should have in his library and it has been collected by Al Imam Al Suyuti in his famous book of Tafsir Al Dar Al Mansur. Now, brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, we would like to dissect this hadith that we know is an authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us about so as to draw from it lessons so as to get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in our religion this hadith is impregnated with many lessons time does not allow us to cover every one of them but the ones that are most important and which are pertinent to us in our community, they are the ones that are going to be addressed and entertained, insha'Allah ta'ala. We begin by first making a point, and that is we understand from this story when we see how Juraj responded when his mother was calling him, we understand that Juraj wasn't a faqih. And a faqih is a person who has fiqh of the religion or understanding of the religion. So it is absolutely possible that a person can be an individual who has a great portion of salat or zakah or sadaqah or he fasts much or he makes umrah or he makes hajj, he speaks the word which is good. But he may not have understanding of the religion. 
And what I mean by understanding of the religion, I mean when he's confronted with issues, with problems, when the people are confronted with issues and problems, he may not have the tools by which to solve their problems and to answer their issues. A lot of times we find many of our brothers who have become members or part of Jamaat al-Tabliq of this nature, they have much, much ibadah, which is something that is good. This is something that is commendable in al-Islam. But when fiqh issues come to them, you will find more times than not, they're not capable of answering those issues. We understand that Juraj was this type of person. And even though he was that type of person, it wasn't bad because Juraj is a person that the Prophet ﷺ took the time out to explain about his life and he talked about him in a good life. The reason why we say that Juraj was an Abid, a person who worshipped much and not a Faqih, is the fact that Juraj was praying a Salat which is Sunnah. And the proof that it's Sunnah is that he was praying it alone, by himself. Because the Salat that is with the Jama'ah, that is followed, it has to be with the Jama'ah. Anyway, when Juraj's mother came to him, she called out to him. Juraj is answering his mother is wajib upon him, is fard upon him. So what happened was he was confronted with a problem where he was doing a sunnah at the expense of something that was wajib and he chose to continue to do the sunnah. This is rejected in Al-Islam. If you're going to do a sunnah and that sunnah is going to uh, cause you to miss out on the fard, it's haram for you to do the sunnah now. It's like a woman who chooses to pray, to, to work. And when she works, she should have her responsibilities, her primary responsibilities as a mother at home. Now it becomes haram for her to work. But if she can juggle the two, alhamdulillah, and her husband is in agreement with that, then there's no problem. Another example of it, of this particular point, is like a man who comes to the masjid for salat al-fajr, or for any other salat for that matter. When he goes into the masjid, he finds that the salat, the fard salat has been established. But he hasn't prayed two rak'at. So being that he's an abid, an extensive worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the authentic hadith, رَقَةَ الْفَجْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا The two rak'at of fajr are better than the dunya and what is in it? So he says, I don't want to miss this out. I don't want to miss out on this reward. So he prays two rak'at. And he misses one rakah or two rakahs of the fard. So he doesn't understand that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in another hadith, إِذَا أُقِيمَةُ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةِ If the salat, the fard salat has been established, the iqamah has been called and it has been established, then it's not permissible to pray any other salat except the fard salat. So we understand from this that Juraj was not a faqih. And that reminds me of two issues. The first issue is what happened with a famous scholar here in Medina by the name of Sheikh Abu, J- Abu, Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, Hafizullah Ta'ala. This man must be about 80 years old or more than that. His wife is about 75, 78, something like this. His wife has become uh, to the point where she can barely take care of herself, not to mention the Sheikh, Hafizullah Ta'ala. So the Sheikh needed someone to take care of his wife. So since he's in a position where he's admonishing the people and he's calling them to do what is right and to leave along what is wrong, he has to be an example to the people. He has to be a person who is, the fur- who is furthest away from what is haram and who is the closest to what is halal and what is mustahab, what is recommended. So here in this society, because Allah has blessed these people and He has tried them at the same time, with a lot of money, you'll find that the average family has servants, women servants as well as men servants who come from Filipino, from Philippines, who come from India, Bangladesh, some of the more poor Muslim countries. So a lot of times, these women from Philippines and these other countries, they come so as to serve these men. They serve their homes. And a lot of times bad things happen. So it's haram for these Filipino women to come from their countries, to come here without a mahram, as well to be in a home where they are alone with men who are not mahrams for them. So what did the shaykh do? The shaykh, in many of his lessons, he always tells, he warns the people about this evil. And what happens 
uh, when we do things like this because there's a serious problem here where the Saudi Arabian women are having babies who are looking Chinese and we all know what the deal is they're looking Chinese but anyway uh, some of them allow their wives and their daughters to be taken to school to be taken to the souk by the Filipino drivers so it's a serious social problem that these people are being faced with at this particular time the point is that Sheikh Abu Bakr Ta'ala, when he saw that his wife was in need of someone to take care of her he went to his original country which is Algeria and he married a 17 year old cousin of his the girl is only 17 the sheikh is almost 80 or more than 80 so he can't do anything with this young girl he can't do anything at all with her but he married her so that she would be his wife and it would be permissible for this girl to be inside of his house alone with him and his wife. The girl takes care of the wife. So this is the fiqh in the religion. The ability to be able to answer the questions that arise in the everyday lives of the people. That's the first point. The second point is something that we tell the people to get away from. And that is taqlid al-a'ma. The blind following of people. Even if those people are scholars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nowhere in the Quran does he tell us to blindly follow those who have knowledge but he tells us to ask those who have knowledge if we don't know and then when they present the delils to us we take the delil and we follow the delil to the best of our ability because we know that the scholars have more knowledge than us so when they present their rulings to us we say to them okay where's the proof for that it is not enough for us just to say Sheikh so and so had this statement we need to know what was his proof what was his delil imam so and so his position is this okay that's beautiful fine and good but what is his delil we can't have this taqlid al-a'ma one of the famous scholars of today by the name of Nasr al-Din al-Albani we find a lot of the brothers who want to call the people to the Quran and the Sunnah all the time they say Al-Albani said, Al-Albani said, Al-Albani said. The same brothers who sometimes criticize the people for blind following, they themselves blindly follow Sheikh Al-Albani. We say, Al-Albani is just like any other Imam. If we're not going to blindly follow Al-Imam Ahmed and Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam Shafi, if we're not going to blindly follow them, then we have more right not to follow Al-Imam Al-Ibani Hafizullah Ta'ala because the four Imams were greater than Al-Imam Al Al-Ibani Al-Ibani can't compare to these people and that's not to take away of the virtues and the superiority of Sheikh Al-Ibani today he is the muhaddith of the, this era but anyway the point is Akhi Ikhwan is that blind following in the religion it's something that's disliked and it's discouraged. Whenever you brothers and you sisters have a question and you present it to the people who are there and, 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 and they are serving in the capacity of, uh, of the people who are supposed to be answering our questions, make sure that you ask them what is the delil. And then after being presented with their delil, if you have another opinion from another brother, then you should say to them, what do you have to say about this delil that this brother is mentioning? Because you can't take something that a brother is taking for an example. This is just an example. Let's say that brother Muhammad, he says that it's haram for a person to make dua after, salat, after any salat you raise your hand. It's haram to raise your hand. It's a bid'ah. Then you go to Sheikh, uh, to, to Sheikh Mustafa and you ask Sheikh Mustafa, what's the ruling? Sheikh Mustafa says, no, it's permissible. Okay, we say to the first Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad, okay, what's your delil? Then we go to the other brother and we say, what's your delil? Sheikh Muhammad gives us his delil and then Sheikh Mustafa gives, his, his, gives us his delil. We look at the delils of both of the men and then we ask each one of them, what do you have to say as a refutation on the delil of the other Sheikh? If they're not able to refute the delil of the other Sheikh, then know for surety you have some delil looking you in your face and it's not permissible, permissible for us just to throw it away and to bury it just because Sheikh so-and-so said something other than this. 
So I just wanted to say that because that's very important. Another issue concerning us here is the fact that a sister may be praying a salat and she may feel that her baby or her child is in danger. What should she do? Should she continue to make her salat or should she go to the rescue of her child? We, in this type of situation, we have to decide what is the less of the two evils. The less of the two evils, of course, is to break the salat and to go to the child and to rescue the child from any, any pending danger. Because, number one, she won't be able to continue her salat in the way that is becoming of a Muslim to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the thing is, Ikhwan, is we have to have the fiqh in the religion. The example of the person who is just a blind follower, for an example, a scholar who's just a blind follower and one who looks for the dalil and he's a fiqh, faqih in the religion, is like the example of two men who sell shoes. One man who's the blind follower, all he can do is take the sayings of the people and store them and when someone comes to him and asks, asks, asks him a question, he's able to throw out like a parrot what he has memorized and what he has stored. But what happens is someone comes with size 10, size 8, size 7 foot. This man, can, he can give him a shoe, size 8, 7, 10, whatever. But when someone comes with a feet the size of, you know, what's that guy who's playing basketball, the Shaq guy, Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, someone comes to him with a foot like that. Okay, he doesn't have a shoe to fit this man's foot. Now there's a new issue that has been presented to this man. All he has is a bunch of sayings that have been stored for him, like a computer, so he can just throw things out like a parrot. But what happens is when he goes to the faqih in the religion, the mujtahid in the religion, the man who has the ability to look in the Qur'an and look in the sunnah, what he can do now is make a shoe that will be appropriate for him. So let us stay, from, stay away from blind following and let us stay away from being the people who are ignorant in the religion. The Prophet has told us in the authentic hadith, he said, مَنْ يُرِيدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah wants good for, if Allah wants good for a man, He gives him fiqh in the religion. And the Prophet wasallam has also explained to us in another hadith, He said that, خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ ذَا تَفَقَّهَ فِي الدِّينِ The best of you in jahiliyyah is the best of you in al-Islam. If you understand the religion. The next point that we come to, inshallah ta'ala, is the importance of treating the parents with honor and in a good way. And I think almost every single tape that has been sent in the explanation of these beautiful hadith, this point, this issue, has come up. So, that's not strange when we see that Al-Islam has placed great emphasis on this point, on this understanding that the parents deserve an honorable position in the lives and in the eyes of the people. Even if our parents are kufar, which is the case more times than not. As we said previously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many ayahs of the Qur'an, after ordering the human beings to make the tawheed in His worship, He next brings to them the fact that they should be good and that they should honor their parents. So the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that we make tawheed and worship in Him and we not make shirk with Him in our ibadah or our worship to Him, that comes as number one in priority. And then after that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses what is next in importance and that is to honor the parents. And we have too many ayahs in the Qur'an like this. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith that has been Collected by Bukhari and, and Muslim, it's Muttafiq alayhi, Abdullah ibn, Ab, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, said that a man came to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what is the deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the best? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, to make salat at its prescribed time. Then, as 
the Sahabas used to do all the time. They wanted to know and they wanted an increase in knowledge and they wanted to know the doors of good. He went on and he said, and then what is the most beloved deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, to be good to the parents, to honor the parents. And we have variations of this hadith, they come many, but all the time we find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam putting in the second one, being good to the parents. We find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us in the Qur'an وَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا And verily, we have ordered the human beings He didn't say just the Muslims We have ordered the human beings to honor their mothers and their fathers For verily, their mothers carried them وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا means that when she was carrying her, the child in her stomach it was difficult for her so we understand from this that the simple fact that our mothers carried us for nine months or whatever the term was that our mothers completed and then delivered us, this was a thing that is in the sight of Al-Islam something that's tremendous. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, in Khutbah al Haja, the Khutbah that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to always open up his sermons with and his lessons with. And we need to learn Khutbah al Haja because Ja- Ab- Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu he said in the authentic hadith in Bukhari he said كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعلمنا خطبة الحاجة كما يعلمنا آية من القرآن the prophet used to teach us the sahabas all of them خطبة الحاجة as he used to teach us an ayah from the Quran so why is it that only the brothers who give talks they're the only ones who learn خطبة الحاجة this is a khutbah that everyone should learn. So for the times when you need it, you can say it. So this Sahaba Abdullah ibn Jabir, he explained to us that khutbah al hajj was taught to them as a group. He didn't just teach it to the people who he was sending out as propagators or who he was sending out to different lands and to different parts of the Muslim empire to be leaders and governors. No, it was taught to all of the people. But anyway, the point is that in Khutbah al Hajjah, the Prophet ﷺ chose to recite out of all of the ayats in the Quran. He chose to recite Allah saying, Ya ayyuhal ya nasi taqu rabbukum al ladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaq minha zawjaha wa basa min huma rijalin kathira wa nisa'a wa taqu Allah ladhi tasa'alun bihi wa arham. And fear, the, and fear Allah and be conscious of the rights of the wombs that have borne you. And be conscious of the right of the womb that has borne you. So this in itself, the fact that we know that the Prophet ﷺ doesn't do anything just to be doing it. He doesn't say anything just to be saying it so as to entertain the people. It has hikmah behind it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he takes this order and he says establish uh, the tawheed of Allah and then be good to your parents and then establish salah and then live up to your contract. This order, one, two, three, four, this is an order that has come that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to put. So we know it has some hikmah to it. So ikhwan, we really need to be good to our parents, even if they are kufar. This attitude that many of us have, that to us, our way, and to you, your way, meaning their mothers and their fathers and their brothers and their sisters, this is an attitude that is far into the religion. And many of us are falling short of the mark. Many of us are falling short of the responsibility that Al-Islam has placed upon our shoulders in terms of giving the da'wah to our parents. There may be some people who say, why does Abu Usama always harp upon this issue? Isn't it enough for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this issue so many times in the Qur'an? That the Prophet sallallahu addressed the issue so many times in the Qur'an? Then Abu Usama said to that person, why are you neglecting your duties to your parents? I think I have more right to put that question forth why are we neglecting the rights that our parents have over us and some of us our parents their origin their birthplace was in some of the southern states Alabama Mississippi North Carolina South Carolina so during that time we know our parents were 50 16 70 years old they had it very hard they ran the risk of being lynched it was very difficult getting jobs. I mean, they had it difficult. And some of them made the ultimate sacrifice for us. In that, they made hijrah from the south to the north, looking for better opportunities. 
And when I say hijrah, of course I don't mean the Islamic hijrah. Because there's no hijrah from the north to the south for kuffar. There's no hijrah for kuffar. There's no hijrah for a Muslim coming from the Muslim states going to the kuffar societies. You don't call that hijrah. Hijrah is leaving Dar al-Kufr, the place of the kuffar, going to the Dar al-Muslimin, Dar al-Islam, Dar al-Salam. But anyway, the point here is that many of our parents left their birthplace not knowing where they were going, what was in store for them, and they went to the north to find a better living. So there are many times when they could have just left us there are many times, I'm talking about some of us grew up in one, you know, parent home. But there are many times that they could have just left us to die on them. They didn't take the time out to find the means and the ways by which they made sure that we weren't going to die. So, Ikhwan, no matter what happened in the past, we need to honor our parents and we need to call them to Al-Islam. The Prophet ﷺ has told us in the authentic hadith, and this hadith is tremendous and has been collected by an Imam Muslim. He said, لا يجزي ولد والدا إلا يجده مملوكا فيشتريه فيعتقه The Prophet ﷺ said, A child will not be able to repay, to recompensate his father or his mother except that he was to find that his father has become a slave. He was in slavery, so he buys his freedom and he frees him. The Prophet has told us in this authentic hadith, you will never be able to recompensate them, give them compensation for what they've done for us. Except that you were to find your father as a slave, and then you gave him freedom. So, inshallah, if we gave them al-Islam, they'll be free of the shackles of jahiliyyah. They'll be free of the shackles of what? Of the ignorance and shirk. And if they were to believe in La ilaha illallah, no matter what they did in the past, no matter what they may do as Muslims, if they believed in La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, inshallah you would, have, you, would, you would have been the reason that you gave them the key to be free from the hellfire and they'll eventually go to paradise. So what I'm saying to you, Ikhwan, is that we need to make a serious effort towards calling our parents to Al-Islam, our relatives to Al-Islam. And if you're the type of individual who's shy or you have some particular problems with your family that they prevent you, those problems prevent you, they make barriers in front of you from even talking to your parents, then at least get someone who has courage. Get someone who you have some, a good opinion of that person, his knowledge, his ability to talk with people and to socialize with people and let that person go to your parents to explain to them what Al-Islam is. The important thing is that you should buy them tapes, you should buy them books, you should make an effort. You should make an effort to call your people to Al-Islam. I think that's enough for that point. Inshallah, we'll go on to the third point. And that is the fact that the mother of Juraj, she could have made dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to correct Juraj. By saying, Allahumma islahu. Allah, correct Juraj. Allah, have mercy upon Juraj. Allah, forgive Juraj for what he just did. She could have made all these types of duas. But... Because of her anger, she prayed for something that was terrible that Juraj be tried with this fitna that he was tried with. So we understand two things from this. Number one, it is not becoming of a person to become angry and to act when he's angry. The Prophet ﷺ told us, whenever one of you becomes angry, let him be quiet. Do not speak. Because when you become angry, you'll wind up divorcing your wife. You would wind up divorcing that sister that you really love. And you may already have divorced her twice. And you become so angry, you tell her, you divorce. And I know what I'm saying. I'm not mad. I got my senses. I know exactly what I'm saying. I don't want you anymore. You're divorced. But then you know you were angry. You really didn't mean to say that. Even though you said, I know what I'm saying. A person becomes crazy when he becomes angry. So the Prophet them told us to do what? When you're angry, if you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie down. Told us in another authentic hadith, when you become angry, to make wudu. For verily, water puts out the anger as the, it puts out the fire. So we need to be careful about responding and acting when we're angry. I've seen with my own eyes people punch concrete walls because of their anger. Only to break their knuckles. What are you going to benefit punching the wall? You're not going to hurt anyone except yourself. Do you not see how his veins start to pop out of his head and out of his neck? How his eyes become all big and he become bloodshot. 
looking like a maniac because anger is dangerous so the man came to the prophet and the prophet sallallahu said to him the man said give me nasiha the prophet sallallahu said la taqta three times do not become angry he said okay give me nasiha do not become angry okay give me nasiha do not become angry this is a prophetic nasiha to all of us and many of us unfortunately we have been tried with this disease of anger and sometimes in our state of anger we go into a rage and we start to harm ourselves and those people who are around us and anger is the type of thing that in Al-Islam sometimes when you make a certain crime it's not enough to say that I was angry when you kill somebody out of anger sometimes you can get off sometimes you can't but you'll still be held responsible for shedding blood that was haram for you to shed so the point is let us control our anger the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as you remember the hadith of the woman who was in the graveyard mourning the death of one of her loved ones he came by her he said ittaqila wasbari he said fear Allah and be patient the woman in her serious sorrow and her sadness she didn't look up she just said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam get away from me you don't know what I'm going through you ain't going through what I'm going through just get away from me so he just walked away he didn't become angry and then grab her by her neck and body slam her to the ground or kick in her head. He didn't do that. Talk about I'm Rasulullah, what you talking about? No, he understood what the problem was. He understood. That's what we need to do. We need to understand and try to put the best construction to the problem. But anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu walked away. When the people informed the woman, Hey, you said that to the messenger of Allah. After that, the woman came back to her senses. There's no sorrow that a person can feel that will make that person if he's a true believer feel well I was sad so it was okay to say that no nah, this woman was a mu'mina she was a believer she hurried to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to apologize to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she had enough heart she knows what she did was a bad thing but hey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives any sin that the sons of Adam commit so she went to the prophet and she said well of Allah very I didn't know it was you please forgive me MashaAllah, what did the Messenger of Allah say? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said In the sabr in the sudmat al-ula Verily the time that you have to have patience is when the catastrophe first hit So when you find yourself akhi hearing that news that's going to make you explode Know that the patience is the time you should use the patience when you first hear that news Sit down akhi, lie down, make wudu Just don't speak, get away from the sister, get out of the house if you have to get out of the house and remind yourself over and over again this is a trial from Allah to see who is going to be the best of us in our deeds don't hit the sister upside the head don't divorce the sister put the best construction to your problem the second point is the dua of the mother of Juraj many times we love our children I mean most of us we love our children and we realize that our children are gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my children for an example they are the lamps of my house the masabih of my faith they're there I mean I love my children but sometimes you can still make dua for your children uh, something bad to happen to them I remember one brother subhanallah and I am not saying this so as to expose the brother because the brother has died rahimahullah, rahimahullah ta'ala but he was a Muslim anyway one time he had a child and we were together and he had to keep his children that day. So they would not cooperate with him. They would always run over there, they were running over here, they were doing so many things. So the child who couldn't have been no more than three years old, who was given the most trouble, he did something. And a man went and got his child and he was screaming out and hollering around and he said, you little mother effer. That's what he said to his child. You little mother effer. I couldn't believe it. A Muslim man, not a Kafir man. As for the kuffar, we know what they be saying to their children. Those kuffar in the streets, subhanAllah, they say all kind of stuff. But anyway, the parent should not make dua upon his children. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith, لا تدعوا على أنفسكم ولا تدعوا على أولادكم ولا تدعوا على أموالكم لا توافقوا من الله ساعة يسأل فيه أطاع فيستجيب لكم. The Prophet ﷺ said in this authentic hadith that has been collected by Imam Muslim Do not pray for calamities to fall upon yourselves And do not pray for calamities to fall upon your children 
And do not pray for calamities to fall upon your monies and what's your, what your possession. He said, it may be that one of you may make a dua at an hour where the dua is accepted, so Allah answers your prayer. You may make dua for you on your child or on yourself or on your mate, on your Mujuma. And we know that there's an hour on your Mujuma day that the dua that is made is accepted. You may make a dua at the, at the last third of the night, and the dua at the last third of the night is accepted. Why you're fasting? Why you're sick? The dua of the parent and the child in and of itself is accepted, as the Prophet ﷺ said. You may make dua at the time between the adhan and the iqamah. So your dua is accepted. So we need to be careful. If we're going to make dua, let's do the hadith of the Prophet. He who believes in Allah in the last day, let him say good. Or let him be quiet. If you're going to make dua, make dua that is good. And we need to also understand ikhwan. Our children, they can make us very angry, as I mentioned before. But we need to understand, if they're small, we need to realize that they're not fully developed intellectuals. So it's expected from them to make mistakes. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need to come to grips with. The sunnah of Allah. They're not developed totally intellectually. They're not complete. So our job as parents is to teach them and to guide them to that which is correct with the best teaching and the best guidance. The Prophet ﷺ has told us in the authentic hadith, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا وَلَا يُوَقِّرْ كَبِيرَنَا He is not from us. The one who is not merciful to the small ones amongst us and he's not respectable or respectful to the elders, the elders from amongst our community. He is not from us. And I'm sure all of you know the hadith that the Bedouin man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam playing and kissing Hassan and Hussein. He used to kiss him in the mouth. He used to kiss him on the forehead. He used to tickle him by squeezing their thighs, by squeezing their, by tickling him on the sides and their ribs, under their arms. Too many hadith. He used to ride around like a horse and they would ride on his back. And there's going to come a, a, a tape, inshallah, the Prophet with the children of the Sahaba. So that we can get some understanding. But anyway, this Bedouin, the Bedouin person is a person who's known for his coarseness. The Bedouin man said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I have ten sons. I've never kissed one of them in my life. The Prophet said, Can I help it if Allah has taken the mercy out of your heart? Can I help it if Allah has taken the mercy out of your heart? And then he said, He who does not have mercy upon those who are on the earth, Allah, the one who is in the heavens, will not have mercy will not have mercy upon him. Not that Allah is in the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over the heavens. But these, you know, on and over and in. In Arabic this is called, uh, what do they call? Zaruf. Zaruf. These are interchangeable in Al-Islam, in, in Arabic language. So when the Prophet Sallallahu says, in the heaven, he means over the heaven. And the proof of that is many. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran So travel inside of the earth and see What was the end result of those who disbelieve He said travel inside of the earth He didn't mean dig a hole and go into the middle of the earth Where you're going to see the worms and those other The, the gold and the other minerals that's inside the earth He means travel on top of the earth But anyway the point is That we need to be patient with these small children The future imams of the ummah the future husbands of the Ummah, the future Mujahideen of the Ummah. And there's another point, and that is, if our children are bigger, meaning they're teenagers, then we should try to appeal to their intelligence, to the intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with. We shouldn't be violent, violent with them. Violence breeds violence. They'll start dealing with you that way, or dealing with their children that way, or dealing with the people that way, or dealing with the other Muslims that way. Appeal to their intelligence, sit them down. Get them to understand, what, what's your religion? Are you a Kaf or are you a Muslim? Okay, I'm a Muslim. Then why are you acting like that? Are, is the, the things that you're doing, are they the deeds of the Muslims or the deeds of the Kufa? Then know for sure to your deeds, speak louder than your words. Like this. Let's, let us appeal to the intelligence of our bigger people. And another important thing concerning these adolescents, these teenagers that we have in our community, we have to start producing some programs for our children. Or they will have no alternative except to be pulled into the society of the kuffar. That's the responsibility of you people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you all. The fourth point is a very important point. And this is the point of what happened with this woman. We saw that Jurajah's fitna came from this woman. 
When she came to Juraj, the Prophet ﷺ said Juraj didn't pay any attention to her. So as a result of that, he wasn't, he didn't fall into making zina with her and he didn't even look at her. So we understand from that, that we can solve a lot of our problems that are coming from this particular issue, the fitting of women, by preventing the mixing of the sexes. We'll get to that later. But anyway, the Prophet ﷺ said in this authentic hadith, please, Lend me your ear. Listen to this hadith that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and it's authentic. He said, "Ma taraktu baadi fitnatan hiya adaru ala rijal min nisa." This is not Abu Usama's statement. Some people have this opinion that I got something against these sisters. Aoudu billah. My appointment with you is in front of Allah. If that's what you think in your heart. You believe that. My appointment with you, I'm not even going to take the time out to even try to address that issue. My appointment with you is your muqiyama in front of Allah, if you think that. By which he tries to nip that problem in the bud before its head even starts to grow. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He tells us in the Quran, he says what? He says, Ya ayyuha nabi قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِيبِهِنْ O Prophet, Tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that they should take their jilabib and that they should make it come down over themselves. This jilbab is wajib for you to wear jilbab, sister. It's wajib for the Muslim woman to wear jilbab because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her to wear a jilbab in this ayah. Many of us are debating whether or not the niqab is wajib or not wajib. Yes, it's a point of difference. No doubt about it. There's a point of difference. The people who say it's wajib got delil. The people who say it's not wajib, they have delil. But there's no point of difference. There's no difference amongst the scholars past and present that a jilbab is something that is to be worn by a woman. And I don't know, I've asked more times than not, the people are telling me that the sisters that I was saying, alhamdulillah, they're wearing jilbab. But I'm getting different reports as to what this jilbab is. The people who know, they know what a jilbab is. So what you people need to do is you need to ask these people, is this the jilbab that we're wearing? I understand that these dresses that are being worn from Morocco, that's what's being passed as being the jilbab. That's what I heard. But anyway, the jilbab is something that's wajib to wear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to do what? To tell the, his wives, his daughters, and the believing women to cover themselves. And he says in another ayat, وَلِيَذْرِبْنَا خُمُرِهِنَّ وَلِيَذْرِبْنَا بِخُمْرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِمْ And let these women take their khimas and let them go below their bosoms. Let it cover up their breasts. Some of us are wearing the khimas, you know, I don't know where, what kind of khimas this is. This is the khimas of the nuns in the Catholic Church. The woman's khimas is something that should go below her, over her bosoms. It should cover her breasts. We shouldn't give a, get an idea as to the size of her breasts. But you see, in spite of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the woman to dress in this way, this way that is respectful to her so that she won't be molested, so that she won't be harmed by the kuffar, because they see this respect emanating from this woman. This is a woman who respects herself. And she's not a loo woman telling everybody you can get a piece of this. You would think that that's enough, right? That all the woman will have to do is dress up like that and khalas, finish? No. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us in the authentic hadith, If a woman leaves her house, period, shaitan beautifies her. Even if she leaves in this type of attire, in this type of respectful dress, this type of dress that Allah chose for all the women of the earth, except those who are older, because they have the right not to wear it if they don't want, and to wear it if they want. And except for our smaller daughters, it's not enough. Allah Ta'ala goes on to say to us, قُلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ In spite of the woman, in spite of the fact that the woman is dressing like this and she's looking like this, Allah Ta'ala Al-Hakim He says to the believing men, and lower your gazes. And lower your gazes, Ikhwan. Some of us will be looking in the street, on Broad Street, and anywhere, in North, wherever, and we're looking at these women and really, 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 really getting off. Not knowing that the Prophet ﷺ said that the sons of Adam, they will make zina and there's no way around it. Verily the eyes make zina and the zina of the eyes is looking. And the ears make zina and the zina of the ears is listening. 
and the hand makes zina, and the zina of the hand is grabbing, and the feet make zina, and the zina of the feet is walking to it, and the heart either makes you go all the way or prevents you. So know for surety we're making zina with our eyes. And Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran, إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصْرِ وَالْفُؤَادِ كُلُّ أُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولًا Allah Ta'ala says, Verily the hearing and the sight and the heart, all of those things will be questioned in the Qiyamah. We'll be questioned about what we saw and what we heard and what our heart hid and what it put forth. So it's haram for you, Ashi, to look at those women. And likewise, it's haram for the sisters to be looking at these men. Allah Ta'ala tells the women believers as well to lower their gazes. So some of us, we have khimaz on, we're, we're wearing the apparel of taqwa, right? We're wearing the dress of a taqwa. We're wearing these beautiful, this beautiful apparel, but the best apparel that the person can wear is the apparel of taqwa, righteousness, to fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's Messenger said in another authentic hadith, إِنَّ أَوَّلْ فِتْنَةٍ أَهْلَكَتْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلٍ كَانَتْ فِي النِّسَاءِ Verily the first fitna that destroyed the children of Israel was the fitna of the women. Here we are Bani Israel, a nation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَضَّلَهُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Allah ta'ala honored them over all the other people. They were destroyed and they lost their place of supremacy in the earth for a number of reasons. The very first reason, of course, according to this hadith, is the problems that they had about their women. They started to go out. They started to take active roles in the community. You know in the story of the mother of Maryam, the grandmother of Isa, alayhim as-salatu was salam when she said in the Qur'an, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتُ السَّمِيرُ الْعَلِيمُ When she said in the Quran, O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, verily, I dedicate to you what is in my stomach. I dedicate it to your service. So please accept it from me. Verily, you are the all-hearing, the all-knower. فَلَمَّا وَدَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّي إِنِّي وَدَعْتُهَا أُنْثَى وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَدَعَتْ وَلَيْسَ الذَّكُرُ كَالْأُنْثَى it went on to say in the Qur'an, and this is about the 30th ayah of Surah Ali Imran. And so when she gave birth to her child, she said, Oh my Lord, really I've given birth to a female child. Allah Ta'ala says, and Allah knows best as to what she gave birth to. And the male is not like unto the female. The ulama, the mufassirun, the people who have made the tafsir of the Qur'an, they say that she wanted a son so as to dedicate the son to the service of the masjid. But at that time, it wasn't permissible for a woman as well to visit the masjid and she was menstruating and things of this nature. This was in their shah. Even though our ulama differ as to whether or not a woman should go to the masjid while she's menstruating, just like they differ whether or not she can read the Quran uh, while she's menstruating, and other than tahara. But the point is, these ulama, the mufassirun of the Quran, they say one of the reasons that she, the reason why she made this dua, she was surprised when she got a girl child because the child, girl child, couldn't do the things that the boy child was able to do. So we understand from that in the time of Bani Israel, the woman was basically in the home. How could it not be? Musa is the brother of Muhammad. Alayhim as-salatu was salam. Their religion is one. Their fathers are one. Their mothers are different only, but their message is one. So therefore, whenever the women of Bani Israel begin to go out, and take an active role, an active part in the society, and they begin to come, become other than mothers, other than righteous teachers of their sons and their daughters, wives of their husbands, they were destroyed, as this hadith has explained to us. So the question that poses itself, Ikhwan, is, if Allah Ta'ala destroyed Bani Israel, a group of people, because of what their women were doing and because of how they were carrying on, don't you think that Allah Ta'ala can destroy our community because of what the women are doing? Of course He can. But uh, So, therefore, we have to take a serious, serious stance 
as to these women. The women should not have positions on the board. No problem. The brothers who are on the board, those we have some sisters, their opinion is better than the opinion of many men. No doubt about that. We're not saying we don't have any sisters, there are no, there, there no good in them. No, we don't say that. But we should let the sisters take care of the responsibilities that are pertinent to the women, and the men should take the responsibility of the men. So someone say, Oh, that brother, I'm telling you, that brother do not like women. He don't like the sisters in the community. Again, I tell you, my point with you is your Qiyam with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're kidzad. You're lying. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us in the Qur'an to stay in your homes. Allah ta'ala told us in the Qur'an, excuse me, to stay in your home. And the Messenger of Allah told us if she goes out, shaitan beautifies her. She makes a fitna for the people. He told us he has not left a fitna greater for us than these women. He told us that in the Qur'an. That's in the Sunnah. So where you get this, that Abu Sama doesn't like women? We better address this issue, Ikhwan. Because I'm telling you, the ramifications of this will be serious. So I don't know why we shuck and we jive and we tap dance and we play around and oh, uh, so, 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 so. weak. We gotta get some backbone. That's right. But a lot of our homes, the sisters are running the show. A lot of our homes, the sisters, they just that's just the fact of the matter. The sisters are running the show. So then that just spills over into the masjid. So sisters, my advice to you is to be happy with what Al-Hakim has chosen for you. Don't be an oppressor. An oppressor to yourself, an oppressor to your husband, an oppressor to the community. Be satisfied with what, with what Al-Hakim Ta'ala has chosen for you. Your place is in your home. It's as simple as that. Ikhwan, it's as simple as that. We better get back to the basics that many of our grandfathers used to know. SubhanAllah. Anyway, we'll go on to the next point. Ikhwan, this point is important. I'm telling you this last point of the separation of the sexes. Putting those women in their place where they belong. We should honor the main servants of Allah Ta'ala. We should honor them. We should love them. We should respect them. We should let people know in the society, if you mess with our women, we'll go to war. We'll go to war. We're ready to sacrifice our lives for our religion. And part of our religion is loving and respecting these women. We need to do that. No, I'm not saying that our women have no place. They have no honor. No, we say, but the honor is the honor that Al-Islam gave them. And the honorable woman is the woman who's satisfied with the place that Allah Ta'ala has given her. We don't want any of these women live maniacs talking about we are all right, brother, brother, brother. We go to the next point. The imam, the people on that board, the administration, this is your responsibility. This is your this responsibility lies on your shoulder. What are you going to do? Allah Ta'ala is looking as well as we are looking to see. You're going to take a stance or not. The next point is the point of Al Hasid. The Hasid of Bani Israel, the jealousy of Bani Israel. If you recall these people were sitting around talking about Jurage, about his worship to Allah and his continuous ibadah to Allah Ta'ala. They should have been happy and they should have took him as an example and said, Wow, how close he is to Musa or to whichever prophet who came to them at that particular time. They should have said, May Allah make us like that. Why don't they go to Juraj and get some, say Juraj, teach us, talk to us, make our hearts soft. Oh Juraj, help us. No. The children of Israel, the Jews, that's how they are. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran in Surah Nisa, He says about the Jews, Am ala ma Allahu min fadri. Allah Ta'ala says to the Jews, Are or are they jealous of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you Muslim out of his bounties? The Jews are jealous of us. The Prophet told us that they're jealous of us because of our Ameen. And just to get off track just for one minute, the Prophet said concerning this Ameen, he said, Man wa imam fa'aminu. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ وَاثَقَ تَأْمِينُهُ تَأْمِينَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَكَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ This is an important point and this is why I have to get off track this for a minute. The Prophet ﷺ said in this authentic hadith, If the Imam says, Ameen, then you people say, Ameen. 
For verily the one whose Amin corresponds with the Amin or coincides with the Amin of the angels, verily Allah will forgive you for your sins. All we have to do is make wudu. Every piece of water that falls off our skin, off our body, it's a sin falling off. Go to the masjid. Every right step that we take, a good deed is written for us, a bad deed is taken away. We get to the masjid and we see the brothers who we love and we stand behind the imam and he reads the Qur'an. For every harf, every character in the Arabic letter that we hear from the Qur'an is ten blessings. Ten rewards for the imam and ten rewards for us to hear it. Ali, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Every alif, lam, ha, ten rewards. For hearing this and for reciting it. We're making the sajda. All we have to do is say, Ameen. And we will get our deeds that we did previously forgiven. If we only did it when the Imam said it. Subhanallah. The fadl of Allah is azim. The bounty of Allah over us is great. But you go to the majority of the masjids. Either the Muslims aren't saying Ameen at all. Like in the Hanafi masjids. Or... When the Imam says, before the Imam says, Ameen, the people say, Ameen. When he says, Well, Dalim, the people say, Ameen. It's from the Sunnah of the Prophet, وسلم, if he says, if the Imam finishes the recitation of the Fatiha, when he gets ready to say, Ameen, as soon as we say, hear him say, Ameen, we begin as a Jama'at to say, Ameen. This is the Sunnah, based upon this Hadith. إِذَا أَمَّنَ الْإِيمَانِ فَأَمِّنُوا فَإِنُّهُ مَنْ وَافَقَ تَأْمِينُهُ تَأْمِينَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Now there's another hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said إِذَا قَالَ الْإِيمَانُ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ فَقُولُوا آمين There's a hadith that says if the Imam says وَلَا الضَّالِينَ They say آمين People may understand that after he says ضَالِينَ we should say آمين but this is again the importance of the fiqh in the religion. There is something that's known as general, and there is something, you know, am, and something that's known as khas, and something that's known as mutlaq, and something that's known as taqeeed. Now is not the time for that, because that will take up the large portion of the tape. I just wanted to spread the sunnah that has died. What you can do is you can go to the brothers, the responsible brothers of the community, and you can talk to them about this issue. And inshallah, you guys, you brothers, you sisters, you'll be doing that. You brothers who should be saying Ameen. The sisters should be saying Ameen by themselves. You know, if they're in the place by themselves or if they're at home praying with the people, with sisters or with their husbands, they can say Ameen. But not in the masjid where they can be hurt. Because the woman is an aura. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Mar'as wa aura. The woman is an aura. Her whole body is an aura. Men shouldn't see her, men shouldn't hear her. That's right, her voice is an aura. shouldn't be heard except out of necessity. But anyway... The point is, let us bring back to life the sunnah. We go back to the issue at hand, and that is the hasad, the jealousy of these people. Allah Ta'ala's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the Jews were jealous of us because of our ameen. And they're jealous of us because Allah Ta'ala has brought it to us to make it known that Yom Al-Jum'ah is the day that we come together. The Jews have Saturday and the Christians have Sunday. They're different. They differ as the monks themselves. What day should they be coming together? And Allah Ta'ala guided us to the right day, Yom Al-Jum'ah. So the Prophet tells us in the authentic hadith, the Jews do not have more jealousy over us than they have jealousy for the fact that we know Ameen and for the fact that we know what day we're supposed to come together for the day of congregation. So these people are people who have jealousy in their heart. And jealousy is a characteristic, unfortunately, that many of the brothers and sisters possess. We hate to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given someone amongst our brothers or our sisters something out of his provision. Subhanallah. It's as if you have a problem with Al-Hakim. The name of Allah is Al-Hakim, one of the names. And Al-Hakim is from the word hikmah. To be able to put things in their proper place, in the place that they go. When you marry a sister who is compatible for you, this is a decision that has hikmah to it because you put it in the right place. So Allah, when He gives this brother that, or He gives this brother this, and He gives this sister that, He gives this sister this, He does this as a child for them, and because He's Al Hakim, maybe He had He gave that thing to you, you would have destroyed yourself. You would have destroyed yourself. So how can you be jealous of someone? Subhanallah, your brother, 
Allah's Messenger Sallallahu said, لا تحافدوا ولا تباغدوا ولا تدابروا وكونوا إخوان بعض الله Do not be jealous of one another. Do not turn away from one another. Do not hate one another. And in another narration, لا تقاطعوا And do not cut one another off. But be brothers, servants of Allah. What gives you the right to be jealous of me? Or jealous of this sister? Or jealous of this brother? What gives me the right to be jealous of you? What Allah Ta'ala has given you? Verily we are being like the Jews. And the Prophet told us, one of the signs of the last day, and this hadith, this tape is also coming, the signs of the last day, the big signs and the small signs, is that we will be just like the Jews. We will do what the Jews and the Christians did. So, they had a problem of becoming hasid, jealousy. Likewise, we have this in our community. And what is jealousy? Jealousy is hating that someone has been given something and you wish that that thing will be taken away from him. This is jealousy. But the Prophet told us in the authentic hadith that has been narrated or collected by Bukhari and Muslim, he said, لا حسد إلا فثنتين رجل أتاه الله القرآن فهو يقوم به آناء الليل وآناء النهار والرجل أتاه الله مال فهو ينفقه آناء الليل وآناء النهار The Prophet said, Jealousy is not permissible except in two instances. In two cases, a man that Allah has given him the Qur'an. So he lives by the Qur'an during the day and during the night. And the second man is the man who Allah has given him money. So he spins out of his money in sadaqah during the day and during the night. One man lives by the Qur'an, he has knowledge of it, he's memorized it, whatever, and he lives by it. We can say... We can, have jealous of, we can be jealous of that man, but what kind of jealousy? The jealousy where you say, oh, I wish I had what that brother had, but you don't wish that what he has is taken away. You want what he has to stay with him, you only say, if I had what he had, I'll do the things that he's doing. It's permissible in this case to have jealousy. But other than that, it's not permissible to have jealousy. And this hadith brings me to a very important issue, Ikhwan. If we're really a people who are saying that we're going to practice Al-Islam according to the way that the fellas practice and understood the religion, then I would like to guide you to something that we need to be doing. Allah Ta'ala's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has allowed us to be jealous of a man who has been given the Qur'an and who has been given money so he spends in the cause of Allah. This jealousy is a mushkila, it's a big problem. It's the first sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was disobeyed with in the heavens when Allah ta'ala told Iblis to bow down to Adam and he was jealous because of that. And he became haughty and arrogant. And it's the first sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was disobeyed with in the earth when the two sons of Adam were ordered to sacrifice something to Allah. One of their sacrifices was accepted by Allah ta'ala and the other one was rejected. So the one whose sacrifice was rejected Qabil, he became angry with his brother Habil and he killed him because he was jealous. But Allah Ta'ala, his messenger, has allowed us to be jealous of two men. One who Allah has given the Quran and the one who Allah has given money and he spends that money. Allah Ta'ala has blessed us in the community with Al-Akh Al-Fadil Ahmed Salim. The brother Ahmed Salim, Sheikh Ahmed Salim, is in our community. And he's the only one that I know of who Allah has caused to remember his book. This is a tremendous ni'mah. A man who's walking amongst us. He's in our midst. And he has the Quran in his heart. I called the brother more than once on the telephone and I disturbed him. Just to ask him some, where some ayat at because they didn't have a concordance in Arabic. And I, don't, I haven't memorized the Quran. So I need a brother. So I called him more than once to say, Ahmed. Where is this ayah? He'll finish the ayah for you and he'll tell you where it is. So believe me, the brother knows the Qur'an. This man needs to be treated by us a certain way. This man has the Qur'an. That's why the one who knows the most of the Qur'an should pray with us. If the one who has the Qur'an is being buried with someone who doesn't have the Qur'an, we put the one who has the Qur'an first. He has honor in Al-Islam. The one who knows the Qur'an has honor in the sight of this religion and the Salaf used to hold this person who had Qur'an in great esteem. So therefore, we should allow the man to go in the door first and to come out the door first. When we're entertaining him, let's say that we're at a house of a group of brothers, we've gathered, 
and Ahmed Saddam is there. We should start to give the food to Ahmed Saddam first. We should give respect to Ahmed Saddam. We know that the man, Allah knows best is what he does with, behind closed doors, but he gives off the impression that he's following the Quran. So therefore, we have been held, we're responsible for the apparent, what we see in front of us. We have not been sent to open up the breast of men and to see what's inside of their hearts. So therefore, let's say that we're entertaining. When we begin to serve, we let Ahmed Salam go to the table first, go to the food first. We bring the food to Ahmed Salam. Let us respect this man. Let us not talk to him anyway. The Quran is the actual words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this man has it in his breast. Someone may say, because unfortunately we have, we, have, we, we have diseases in his heart. Abu Sam is saying that because he wants something from Ahmed Salam. Hey, my appointment with you is in front of Allah Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Now I'm in front of Allah Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Ahmed Salam can't give me nothing. He can't give me anything. He doesn't have any money to give me. He can't make my, my status up or down. He can't harm me, can't help me. Rabbi Allah. I'm just giving you the haq and this is how it is. So anyway, one time, the Prophet, many times, he was sitting in the city and the man who was entertaining the Prophet along with his sahabas, he came into the room with a bowl of milk and he went to the Prophet and he gave the Prophet to drink. And on the right of, Abu, uh, on the, right of the Prophet was Abu Bakr and on the left of the Prophet was a Bedouin. And another... On the right of the Prophet وسلم, was the Bedouin and on the left of the Prophet was Abu Bakr. In another narration, a man brought the Prophet وسلم, some milk and on the right of, Abu, uh, on the, right of the Prophet وسلم, was a little boy and on the left of, and on the left of Rasulullah وسلم, was Khalid ibn Walid. When the man brought the bowl, he gave it to the Prophet and the Prophet drunk. Then the Prophet said to the person to the right, should I give to the person to my left? Because the person who was on the Prophet's left was better than the one who was on the Prophet's right. Abu Bakr was greater than the Bedouin. Khalid ibn Muli was greater than the young boy. In each instant, the person on the right said, I will not allow someone to take my place over when something like this concerning Rasulullah. And they, the Prophet gave it to the person on the right. This hadith is impregnated with a lot of benefits. And I say this just to connect it with Ahmed Sana. We know that the man, just imagine this for a minute, the man who's bringing the bowl into the house, into the city. Of course the man, the person who's on the left of Rasulullah is going to be on the right of the bowl carrier. So we know in the Sunnah the Prophet has told us to start with the right in everything that is good. But the man didn't start with the right. He gave the bowl to the most knowledgeable, to the most respectful, to the most honorable. He passed over the person who was on his right and gave it to the one who was the most knowledgeable, the most respectful. And upon receiving that, the one who jumped the bowl, Rasulullah, the most knowledgeable, the biggest one, the most respectable, from him it started to go to the right. He has the choice. He has to take, he has to take permission from the one who's on his left who may be better than the one on the right and say, do you what? Whatever. But anyway, the point is, when we come into the room, one person may think you have to start from the right. This is from the Sunnah. If you started from the right and everyone was equal, or was the type of sitting where no one had any superiority over anyone else in any shape, short, form, or fashion. Right? But let's say that we have a respectful person here. I told you the Hadith, the Prophet said, He is not from us, the one who does not have mercy upon our small ones, and he does not respect and honor our elders. So let's say that your father was in the room. You should start with your father. Let's say that a scholar was in the room. You should start with the scholar. Let's say that Ahmed Salam was in the room. We should start with Ahmed Salam. And don't let a person think that you have to start on the right at all times. No. Since the Prophet, this happened in his presence and he didn't say anything. This is from the Sunnah in which the Prophet ﷺ allowed something to be done and he gave his affirmation of it. So the point is, let us respect the brother in the way that is befitting for him. Let us honor the brother. He has the Qur'an. And this is a tremendous ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see the works that he does. We see the classes that he gives and so forth and so on. And we see the results of those classes with many of the brothers who are being taught by the brothers. The next thing is that this 
Hasid, this jealousy, it caused the children of Israel to do other sins. And this is how sin is. The nature of evil and the nature of sin is that Shaitan, he doesn't want you just to stop at that one thing. One sin is holding on to the ankle of another sin. Who is holding on to the ankle of another sin and it's just a chain reaction. That's how it is. So what happens is, first the brother, he looks at the sister and she looks at him and they establish eye contact. And they feel the chemistry between them. Then after that, they get one another's telephone number and they talk on the telephone. And then after talking on the telephone for so much time, they meet one another. And then after meeting one another, they make Zena. And then after making Zena, she gets pregnant and she has to have an abortion. You see what I'm saying? This is how the sin is. Or the brother drinks some wild Irish rose, or he drinks some tea bird, or some old English. You know, these are the things that were out back then. You know, they're bringing out all this new stuff now. No drugs, crack, and all this. They're bringing all this synthetic stuff out. They may be doing the same thing with the brew, you know? The brew scheme may be like that as well. But what he does, he hits the pipe, he torches it up once or twice, hit, drinks some brew. Then what happens? He goes, he rapes a woman. He steals something. He leaves, leaves Salah. And one sin just opens up the door for another sin. And it's a chain reaction. So their jealousy, what did it do? It caused them to make another sin, which was what? They accused the man of fornication with the woman. Something that he was innocent of. And we know to accuse a believer of fornication is a great sin in al Islam. This is a tremendous sin. It's one of the major sins in al Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that has been narrated by uh, Abu, ba- Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu and it's in Bukhari he said اجتنبوا السبع المبيقات Stay away from the seven major sins that will destroy you. So he named six of them and the last one he said وَقَصْفُ مُحْسَنَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ الْغَافِلَةِ This hadith is in Bukhari as well as Muslim. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, stay away from the seven major sins. He named them. Shirk with Allah, magic, riba, killing a person, and on and on. The last one, the one that interests us now, he said, and accusing the married, believing women who are innocent of making adultery. Because it says the women, that doesn't mean I can't accuse the woman, I, can, I can't accuse the woman, but I can accuse a believing man. No, this is a makhraj al ghadab it says woman here because uh, I don't know how to explain makhraj al ghalib you can ask the people who are responsible there what does that mean but anyway the point is when you accuse a Muslim man or a Muslim woman of having sexual relationship whether they're married or not married this is a tremendous sin you have to have four witnesses to do so and just because you can make this accusation and nothing is done to you you know you don't bring four witnesses so nothing's going to happen to you because no one can establish the hudud just because this isn't established, don't think that Allah Ta'ala is not angry with you. Don't think that Allah Ta'ala doesn't hate that thing. Don't think that you're going to have an appointment with that one who you accuse, Yom al Qiyamah. This is a terrible sin. So they accuse this man. We need to stay away from this. If a person comes forth and they say, so and so made Zina with me. When we go to that person, we say to that person, did you make Zina with this person? They accuse you of making Zina with me. If that person say no, I didn't make Zina with you with that person, then what happens is the one who said I made Zina, they're guilty in our eyes. And the one who said I didn't make Zina, this person is innocent in our eyes. Even if that person is pregnant. The one if the woman is pregnant, the one who said if they were denied and rejected that they made Zina, if this person didn't bring four witnesses to prove it, it's not enough for that person to say I made Zina with that individual. So the one who said I made Zina is guilty. Because there's no delil that is stronger than the guilt, than the delil of confession. We don't need no delil after that. A person confesses. So therefore let us stay away from this. And some of us, we come into Islam and we bring a lot of the baggage of Jahiliyyah with us in Al-Islam. And a lot of us are working on getting rid of that baggage. Some of us are, you know, from the street. And there are a lot of things that we need to do to correct ourselves. May Allah help all of us. May Allah bring us all closer and help us all. And make those who are around us also those who help us to better ourselves. Some of us are tried. We have the problem of not being able to say three or four words except that we have to curse. Know for a surety when you curse, 
First of all, you're doing something that's against the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ used to didn't curse. And second of all, the curse word mother effa. If you said this to a Muslim, man or woman, you mother effa, then you have accused that person of not only making zina, but you've accused him of making the worst form of zina, making it with his mother. In the Islamic society, if people hurt you, call someone by that name, you can be punished for that. Likewise, we shouldn't call a Muslim woman a hoe. You hoe. Even if that woman is, for an example, Um Kalsum, is a famous Egyptian singer. And we know those people who are in that type of life, they have a lot of evil to them. Some of them are even kufar. But let's say we don't know about the kufar of some of them. It's not permissible for us to say, Oh, that hoe. Like Iman. We don't know about this girl's aqidah inside of her heart. If we don't know about her aqidah in her heart, the Muslim does not make takfir of another believer. So it's not permissible for us to say to a Muslim woman, you ho, no matter how bad we may see that individual. It's not permissible. Because you're accusing that girl of making zina. And that's not permissible unless you have four witnesses. So now we go on to the next point, inshallah ta'ala ikhwan, and that is, these people, they also believed the girl who they knew was a lewd woman. And the people, you know, the masses, they're like that. They believe what they want to believe. And they're not concerned about where's the delil, where's the proof. When accusations are made about people, the masses, you know, they believe what they want to believe. In our community, unfortunately, we've been afflicted with the same problem. We've been afflicted with this same problem. We have the crab in the bow mentality. The crab in the bow mentality that we haven't rectified as of yet. And one problem we fall into as individuals and as a community is the problem of marriage. Whenever we hear of a brother and sister having problems, whether they got divorced or not, we get one side of the story and the sisters, they side with the sisters. And the brothers, they side with the brothers. And the sisters who don't like or who have a problem, a personal problem with the sister who's involved, you know, the sister who's getting divorced or who's having the problem, the sisters who have a problem with her, they side with the brother. And the brothers who have personal problems with the brother who's getting divorced or who has family problems, they side with the sisters. What's wrong with you people? Where is the community spirit? Where is the love for one another? Where is our minhaj al ilmi? How are we going to, uh, how can we find out the hop based upon this type of way? This is how we're going to scholastically approach the issues. Just by taking sides. Well, the sister is a friend of mine, so I'm going to be with her. Or the brother's always oppressing the sisters, you know? It's like Team A against Team B. The New York Giants against the Dallas Cowboys. This is the type of attitude we go about. This is how we look at it. Them against us. But we're one community. Hold on to the rope of Allah altogether. And do not let, let anyone oppress anyone else. And if two factions of the believers are at war, then bring peace between them. And then if one faction refuses to come to the round table and get itself together, then all of you fight that one person or that party. Where are we from this understanding, Ikhwan? I have to say, Marriages and divorces, they are a natural phenomenon of the human experience. They're going to happen, they've happened, and they continue to happen. My advice to you people is to understand that Yom Al-Qiyamah, we got to stand before Al-Qawi, Al-Qabit. We have to stand before Allah Ta'ala, the strong, the one that when He grabs you, Allah will grab you a grab that you can't get away. These marriages and these divorces are fitness. Many of us have taken the opportunity to get into the business of other people and it's not our business. What are you worrying about? The fact that so-and-so got divorced. It doesn't concern you. It doesn't concern you. So why do you make it material for conversation between you and sister so-and-so, you and brother so-and-so? Don't you know that person doesn't appreciate you talking about that? And more times than not, you don't have the full preaching. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't have both sides of the story. You don't know it's only intelligent. Ikhwan, it's only intelligent. And it's in your best interest to mind your own business. 
Now, mind your own. We have enough problems in our own home to be going out worrying about what other people are doing. If you live in a glass house, how you going to throw rocks? How? Doesn't make sense. What does it harm you? Achi, uchti. What does it harm you just to shut your mouth up and be quiet? He who believes in Allah in the last day, let him say good. Let him speak a word which is good or let him shut his mouth. People talk too much. So-and-so got divorced and the brother was doing this and the brother was doing that and he was doing this and he was doing that. Sister, where do you get that information? His wife, his ex-wife told me. Did you talk to the brother? No, I don't need to because I know he did it. I know the brother from Jahili. I know him. I know him. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu fatabayyanu Oh, you believe? If an evil person comes to you with news, ascertain as to the truthfulness of that news. Find out, get the details, get the facts. Ascertain as to what has happened. And you can't ascertain as to what has happened, get in half of the picture. Why does Allah say that? So it may be that you may harm people without knowing and you become sorry for what you've done. Look what they did to Jurej. They destroyed the man's hamlet. They destroyed it. They didn't come and say, Jurej, what's your side of the story? They just dragged him down, broke his thing, tied him up, got rid of the stone. That's how we are. We want to be the court. We want to be the judge. And we want to be the executioner. Subhanallah. Won't you give the brother the opportunity to get a lawyer? No. I know him from Jahiliya. I don't like him anyway. Subhanallah. You people need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is shameful. It's shameful. Know when a person gets divorced in the community, this is a problem for the community. It's not something that we should make it worse by, you know, eating the flesh of the two people involved. This is something bad. What's going to happen to the children? They run the risk of going astray. They run the risk of going astray now. We lost children from our community, from our ummah. It's serious than we think it is. That's why the Prophet said in the authentic, authentic hadith. If you people knew what I knew, you would laugh less and you would cry more. You would laugh less and you would cry more. Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to us. And he doesn't hold us account to everything that we're doing as a community and as a group of people. Because if he was going to hold us to account, subhanAllah, verily our punishment, our punishment would be serious. Allah have mercy upon us as a community. So, I just want to end this by saying, we should get our own lives together before starting to worry about what other people are doing. The Prophet said in this authentic hadith, من حسن إسلام المرء تركه ما لا يعني From a person's good Islam From a person good Islam is his leaving alone that which does not concern him That which does not concern you, leave it alone You have enough problems in yourself If we were to come to you and we were to look at your personal life We will find that you got a whole bunch of skeletons in your, in your closet that you, didn't, you need to make janazah on You have a lot of them in your closet so, Ikhwan, let us be brothers, let us be sisters. If you don't know what you're talking about, be quiet, first of all. Do you not know the story of Suleiman Dawood? Two disputants came to Dawood. One of them had 99 sheep, the other one had one sheep. The one who had one sheep said to Dawood, Hey, this is my brother, he wants to take my one sheep, and he speaks to me very harshly, and he insists that I give him my sheep, and he overpowers me in speech. This story is in Surah Al-Sab. Before even asking... He gave a judgment. He said, Verily, he has wronged you. Then he realized Allah tested him. You gotta hear both sides of the story. Look at Yusuf. And the tape is coming of the benefits that we get from Surah to Yusuf as well, inshallah ta'ala. When the woman, her husband came into the door, the first one to speak was the woman. Hey, what's gonna happen? What, she's the, what is the punishment of the one who tries, who tries to seduce your wife? She's the first one to say anything. You can't make a judgment based upon the first thing you hear or the fact that she's crying and she's emotional and 
No! Not like that! Islam is not like that! The Prophet said in the authentic hadith, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشْرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ وَإِنَّكُمْ تَخْتَسِمُونَ إِلَيَّ فَأَحْكُمُ بَيْنَكُمْ بِمَا بَدَأَ لِي He said, Verily, I am a human being like you people are human beings. And verily, people, you people come to me with your problems. So what I do is I judge based upon ma badali, what has been made apparent and clear to me. And it may be possible that one of you may be more eloquent with his speech than his brother. So I judge for him with what is rightfully his brother. I give to him what is his brother based upon what I hear. So if I give you that, then either take it or leave it. But let him know you're taking a piece of the hellfire. Most of us are not qualified to be judges. If the disputants have not asked for our opinions, and they, not have, they haven't asked us to come and sit and to judge, then we need to shut our mouths and we need to just mind our own business. And I think that's enough, inshallah, concerning this most important issue. Let us not be like the masses, getting involved in other people's business and we don't have half the story. Now I'm back to the point, Ikhwan, we go on to the next issue, which is a simple issue, and that is that miracles can happen with other than the prophets. The Jews, you see, they had this man who was amongst them, and other people from amongst the Jews, who a lot of miracles happened with them. So Juraj, even though he wasn't a faqih, he was a wali of the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find that, again, in the last tape that we said, the sign to know the wali is that you have to take his deeds and place it along with the Quran and the Sunnah. And then we say he's a wali or he's not a wali. And then the next point is that the Jews, they made wudu before their salah. Because Juray said, let me make salah. And then the Prophet said, so he made wudu and he made salah. This is just a point because many of the ulama, they say that wudu is something that's khas, that's especially for our ummah. And this is not the case because this hadith refutes that understanding. They say it's special for our ummah because the Prophet told us Yom Al-Qiyamah the Muslims will come and the part that they wash them will, will, will do, meaning their faces, their hands up to their elbows, their feet.